up on Tech News today, Windows has a new logo. Will it get the gap treatment from the Internet? Also, Google's web tracking explained. And Android's unlock patent. What that means. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Friday, February 17th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog for a free trial and 15% off your new account for six months. Go to Squarespace.com and use offer code TNT2. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm Darren Kitchen. And I'm Jason Howell. And it's Friday. And I almost used another F word because... Man, it was it's a hard Friday, 24 hours. Friday. It's kind of flat. So you, it was Friday. a hard 24 hours? Yeah, Why? I spent the past 24 hours dealing with a crashing hard drive. Oh, uh, fried you know, hard computer drive. Computer issues are guaranteed um, to turn any mood sour. Darren knows what I'm talking about. So did I. Yeah. My red died. Uh oh. Wait, Ayaz, didn't you say in prep that? These happen in three. They happen in threes. I mean, that means we have to look out for the next celebrity hard drive to go. Now we know, <laughs> we know that when somebody in the chat room lost a hard drive. That should be three, but you never know. Sarah, are you backed up? No, because I'm not backed up. I'm, I'm, I'm backed up. I'm just. I back I'm back up, up once a day. Ooh, so my mm, my time good. machine backup is about once fifty days out of date. Uh, so it's probably. Gonna I be actually me. was able to back up again last night just to make sure I wasn't missing anything before it crashed for good. Well, I'm still but now I only have a 120 gig hard drive in my house to put on my in my laptop, which means that I can't put the 420 gig image of my previous hard drive on it. So I have to wait for a new hard drive to come in. The I just love the Tom. Cloud. Just P- PK zip that thing. Just. Boop, PK zip, it'll be smaller. And and I can install it as a PK zip? No, I'm, yeah, I don't think <laughs> I was like, do you know something? You're hack five, man. Maybe you know something. Maybe you can recode all your music to like two kilobits yeah, per second. Yeah, DD, if equals, of equals, dev null, you'll be good. <laughs> yeah, no problem. All right, let's, uh, let's start our show off with uh, the most important story out there today. Microsoft has officially announced a new logo. <gasps> this is a big change. I know a lot of people were angry about the start button missing and all kinds of weirdness with Metro, but Microsoft decided they have officially redesigned their Windows logo. Instead of the flag, it is now more of a flat window at an angle. Venture now, Beat says it looks like it was made in paint. Now, gone is a colorful flag. It's monochromatic, and as, as you're using the, the device, the color can change, so that's a little nice. The logo was designed with the help of Pentagram, now, I know that sounds like... Not, de- it wasn't he- with the help of witches. Are, no, it's this was going through dis- their goth phase. Yeah. Is that happened? This is, a, this is a, 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 a set of graphic designers who've taken care of things like the graphics. I mean, the logo for uh, One Laptop Per Child, MoMA, Citibank, well, City, uh, Oprah Winfrey Show, the Guitar Hero logo. So they have some experience with this. And one of the folks at Pentagram asked, hey, your name is Windows. Why are you a flag? And so that's when they decided to go back to that window logo. What'd you call me? A flag. That's a, well, an it L was there. a windowed flag. Right. But the I thing is, if liked it. Microsoft also put up uh, the history of its of its different <laughs> logos, and it looks a lot like the original Windows 1.0 logo. It's a blue. If you scroll down, you will see the beautiful. That's eight. Keep that's going. the new one. There, oh, oh. there it is. You see that? It's oh, kind yeah. of like the original. It's almost different, a throwback. Different typeface. And in a way, around. the original looks almost more like that Windows phone interface where you've got your, <laughs> yeah, it does, you've got your right. different windows, but they're askew. But it's so elegant. I mean, the new one It is, looks less like the Swedish flag than the new one. The new one's got the uh, the perspective on it for you, so you can feel the progress. You know, we're going from left to right. It's coming at you, you know? I don't know. Last time they tried the perspective thing, I remember it was Internet Explorer 1.0, and they had the f- Windows flag. And the perspective was, well, the clouds were going up and to the left, meaning the Windows flag was crashing down to the earth. It was, of course, before the spinning E. Well, it never did crash to the earth, though. And no, it perpetually... Depends. Like, like plummeted was crashing. to the earth, but it never made it. So the, the, my question I have is, are we going to see a gap-like rebellion on the internet uh, against this logo, or will people uh, just shrug it off? I don't hate this logo. I actually like it. I it's like simple, it. I um, but it's <laughs> absolutely not offensive. It also looks like more it. like the way we're coming to know Windows design. This looks 
just like how I feel right. Windows 8 should look, much more than a flag. Stop laughing at me, Tom. I'm being honest. <laughs> no, it's just, this, want... looks, this looks like Windows makes me feel. <laughs> so, so we, got, we have high praise. It's prayer. coming at me all jagged like. <laughs> I don't hate it. This is how I expect it. <laughs> I think it's different. Is it stuck? <laughs> I'm just. Uh, this is I what feel so good. you feel so Windows, right? Nom, Love nom, story nom. for the Windows logo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else on this very important story before we? Move I on? truly don't expect there to be a backlash. Uh, I don't think we're going to see a gap kind of work. Uh, oh, we're going to go backwards. Microsoft's already done every which way. Maybe that'll be the Windows 8 logo when you're actually in the in the start screen, and then when you go to desktop, it goes to the other one. So everybody's happy. Oh. Maybe. Maybe they'll give in. Well, like will the Windows that. logo be on ARM? I don't know. Well, let's get to, to the big story of the day, for, for real. Uh, Google uh, being hit with an FTC complaint and a lot of sturm and drong on the Internet about a discovery of how they use cookies in Safari. A Stanford researcher named Jonathan Mayer, uh, and then his work was later confirmed by an independent Wall Street Journal researcher, found that Google's DoubleClick, along with Vibrant Media, Media Innovation Group, and Point Roll, are all using an iframe trick to set cookies in Safari that would otherwise be blocked. And this problem also occurs in IE6 and IE7, but can be resolved there by sending a simple P3P header. Instead, in Safari, you have to uh, use a little a little bit of a workaround if you want to set a third-party cookie. Under the default settings of Safari, in both desktop and iOS versions, you can only accept files from sites that individuals specifically visit or interact with. So the reason these ad companies need to get around this is if I'm on site x.com and DoubleClick is serving their ad from y.com, they can't set a cookie. That's because I don't want to be tracked, right? Developer Anant Garg first described a method to get around this in 2010 using a blank form sent in the background. Now, after all of this hit the Internet and there was all of this furor over Google is tracking you, even though you say you don't want to be tracked, Google said in a longish statement uh, that the journal mischaracterizes what is happening and why it's happening. They say, we used known Safari functionality to provide features that signed-in Google users had enabled. It's important to stress that these advertising cookies do not collect personal information. Uh, and, and essentially what was going on is because Safari blocks the third-party cookies by default, and third-party cookies are allowed when a form is posted, Google wanted to include plus one buttons in ads served by DoubleClick, which is owned by Google. But since DoubleClick comes from DoubleClick's domain and Google Plus comes from Google Plus's domain, Safari was blocking the ability to check to see if you were signed in when you clicked the Google Plus button. So they used the workaround that Anant Garg had described to use a form when you clicked on Google Plus to post and be able to set the cookie to see if you were logged in. Google claims this had the unintended side effect of allowing other cookies to be set from other advertising involving DoubleClick. Google has since shut off the form and is actively removing the cookies that were set unintentionally. Hey, this so, is an exploit that was discovered and published back in 2010, and Apple hasn't done anything about it yet. Doesn't that seem weird to anybody? I, mean, I don't know. Does it, this, doesn't Apple care? Well, actually, uh, an, an update to WebKit, which is the framework that Safari is built on, in fact, Chrome is built on that as well, has closed that loophole. And that bug fix was prepared by two Google engineers. Well, was it prepared by two Google engineers because they're just trying to... It, no, it's probably two Google engineers that work on Chrome and know nothing about what's going on with DoubleClicks, my guess. Yeah, but the thing is, if Apple knew about this in 2010, or this was published in 2010, that mm -hmm. is, maybe the, the, what Google's phrasing, functionality, maybe that's really what it is. I mean, if, if this is something that Google needs to do a workaround to do, not necessarily an exploit. It's like, look, we just need to get this cookie in there. Now, the question is whether other, I guess, like nefarious sites did the same thing or not. The other, the other issue is what could Google have done in, were they supposed to just change everything they do with their, with their domains and say double-click actually goes through google.com slash whatever, so that way you can have the cookie from the first-party site. I mean, I don't know if, if that would be up, up worth Google's time to do that. And if maybe they just tried it out, 2010, nothing happened. I can see why. You know, go, go ahead, Darren. Well, I'm just saying, Sarah, you say this is an exploit. I agree that this is nothing more than a workaround. If you look at... No, no, no. I'm not calling it an exploit. I'm saying it was published as one. 
Sure, it may have been. Uh, well, yeah, it was published as an exploit, but if you look at like uh, the source code of a lot of major websites, you're going to see some really nasty code in the head that basically says, if it's this version of IE, use this weird-ass workaround that's not published in the uh, the APIs or anything just to make the thing work. And when you're a web developer and you're trying cross-platform, cross all those different browsers, and you're just trying to make the thing work, and, oh, hey, look, here's a way where we can make the thing work, you just... You just implement the code that works. And if that that seems to be an exploit, sure. Well, even if that's the case, Google's now in hot water. Consumer Watchdog, an advocacy group, has asked the Federal Trade Commission to investigate whether Google violated their privacy agreement with the FTC. They agreed with the FTC a few years back that they would never change how they exploit the personal information of people without informing them first. And Consumer Watchdog says this is a violation of that. They were tracking people when people thought... They weren't being tracked because they had the default uh, behavior of Safari hey, blocking cookies. this sounds familiar. <laughs> Wi-Fi sniffing of 2010. Mm, Google yeah. saying, familiar, we did it? this, but we didn't do it on purpose. We're sorry. We'll just get rid of it. It's, it's, this is just a feature. This is just the way it works. You, post, you send the post, and then it allows the cookie. It's not, it's not my fault that your laptop accepted the probe request or reply. I mean, that's just that's the way the spec is. We actually know a little bit more about it in this case because it's, it's, because it's HTML or, or at least you know web code. And, and remember that, that Garg, the guy who posted this, didn't post it as an X point. Uh, he didn't post it as a hack. He said, look, if you're trying to set a cookie in this situation that won't allow you, here's, here's a function of Safari and WebKit that allows you to post it. I think one of the things that this brings attention to is actually uh, at the end of the one of the articles linked was, uh, you know, Google saying, hey, you can actually go to Google's ad preference manager and set your settings for things like these. And that's something that I hadn't thought about in forever until I, I you know, obviously Googled it. And if you go to about mm -hmm. ads .info slash choices, it. it scans your computer, sees what cookies are on your system and who you have opted out of. And uh, and you can just go ahead and check boxes and say, from now on, no more from, you know, this, that, and the other, double-click included. It seems like a fine line for Google, though. If, if the Consumer Watchdog group is saying, okay, look, the users didn't know what was going on, and then Google's like, look, you are signed into our services. We want you to still be able to access our, you know, our services the same way. And we have this weird workaround. Like, you knew you were signed in. And the fact that Google had to do weird workarounds so you can still access some of their services doesn't necessarily seem like yeah. it's not noticed or anything. So I'm, I think where they those. get in problem is those unintended cookies from DoubleClick mm -hmm. that got set later. And, and I, I think Google has a very clear defense, and probably these other companies do too, that this was not the intended usage of this. I don't know. That's what the FTC would have to determine. If the FTC decides to even take up this complaint, they may not. We, we don't know. The FTC doesn't make it public how they react to these complaints. We only know that a complaint has been filed. But I, I think it, it is a testament to, well, first of all, that it's Friday and a slow news day, but also uh, to the, the tenor of our discussions with Google that immediately people are leaping to the conclusion that Google's doing something nasty and privacy violations, you know, at, we're, we're very twitchy about that. Even if it looks to me like there's really not a privacy violation going on here, that they were just trying to see if you were logged in. Well, and in many cases, what Google was doing was making being on a mobile version of a browser a lot more fun if you're the kind of person who wants to click plus ones and, uh, you know, use the Internet as... A lot of sites have now been built to be used. This is all, you know, these are buttons that when you when you click them, you want the, it to just, you know, turn blue. Like, oh, you just right. press one it rather than, oh, this now is, you have to log in. You know, yeah. nobody I mean, really wants look, that either. If you look back at the whole history of computing, just trying to make all the things work, a lot of times includes some nasty hacks. And this, I just crocked this up to another one of those. Yeah, I, I, frankly, all web pages are hacks. I mean, ask any web developer. Yeah. I mean, HTML, any of this is, working HTML right now. is a hack. HTML yes. is meant to take academic papers and, and put hyperlinks in them. You know, so this, this is all workarounds. It's all a matter of semantics of where we think the line is between what's an exploit and what's a workaround. All right. Let's move on to patents because that's much clearer. Patently Apple reporting that uh, Google published a patent earlier this month that would offer Android manufacturers new options 
to unlock future Android devices. Patently Apple suggests that this might play out in several ways based on how the patent is written. One is to have the user drag one icon to another icon on the screen. That could be most useful if you want to open the phone and go right into an app. Say you want to go right into Facebook. You want to go right into the camera. You could actually drag the icon of that app to another icon and unlock your phone right into that app. There's also mention of voice-activated unlocking as well as the option to draw an unlocking pattern on the touch screen. Uh, a lot of people are looking at this and saying, hey, Google's got a patent that can help them fight Apple because Apple won that key ruling we talked about yesterday that Motorola Mobility is violating Apple's slide to unlock patent in several of its mobile devices. Now, first of all, Google doesn't actually have this patent yet, right? What does it mean that it's published, Sarah? What it means is that it is now, it has been filed and it is now public information, which will prove prior art, meaning that if someone else comes along and says, oh, you know, that, that you didn't have a patent yet, Google can say, no, 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 look, this was published on this date. You can't just go ahead now and take this idea. So theoretically, you should have known about it. Exactly. Now, does this actually, is this actually a weapon against Slide to Unlock? No. No, I mean, well, it could be. Well, this, the thing about this story is it's completely overblown. People really yes, lose but their... it's one patent store we can all grok because we can all physically see it on our phones and be like, I slide to the right. Or okay, I well, have a Samsung phone, so I slide up. That's what, yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's what, why it's This is why my, my head is in my hands. Because it. here's the thing. Okay, here's the Apple patent, okay? It's about a predefined motion. Or you have, you have a graphical interface. I don't have the actual words in front of me because I've read this enough times. So this is how it works. If you've seen an iPhone, you know how this works. They say... A rectangle, you move from left to right in a predefined path. That's what their patent covers. So if you want to do a workaround, guess what you do? You remove the predefined path, which is something we've seen with Android phones with gestures in those nine points, and you can draw a little shape. Or it's not predefined, user-defined. I think Microsoft actually has a patent on some weird user-defined gestures too. So the fact that Google will have, well, may have this patent where it comes to sliding a, an icon to another icon, which is you know, fascinating. Let's say they get that. Now, I guess what, what happens is Google will have their weapon and Apple would have their weapon and everyone will chill the hell out. It'll not have a chilling effect, a chill out effect. It'll have a chill because out effect. I like that. Google, can say, Google can say, look, you know, we got this and we totally will not give anybody any hassle if you put in an Android. Actually, it's in the default Android 4.1, 5.0. It doesn't really matter. It's just, it, it, you're not going to see people clubbing each other over the heads about this. It's just going to be, okay, we got this. We're this good. isn't the lawsuit patent. This is the measuring the pile patent. Yeah, it's like yeah. Google finally did something right. smart and patented something they came up with. That's a, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's the story here. That's the real story. <laughs> patent poor Google. All right. Good if job, it's a predefined Google. path, then all it really needs to be are two points, and you could still do the same motion if you so choose to get from point A to point that's B. That's right. But that's, you're doing the same exact thing, but it's not predefined, so you could also go around it and to the other and point. And that's the fun thing about patents that people seem to forget. Like, just be, like the things you have to distill to English is what's covered. Mm, right. It's not like the idea that everyone says, you patented an idea. No, you didn't. You didn't. You patented a method. And so I'm going to, I'm going to chill out now. You, can do you chill out, Iaz. Go to chilloutaffects.org for more. No, I'm actually in the midst of registering it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. You know, you could, you could create chilloutaffects.org yes, at our sponsor. Today's show is brought to you by squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create any kind of website or blog, whether it's chill out effects or anything else. Uh, easy to use UI. You can create it in a snap. You don't need a credit card to try it. Just go to squarespace.com, put in the name of the blog you want to create, uh, and you're off and running. In fact, you can import your current blog from WordPress, from Blogger, from almost every service out there and try it out for free. See what it looks like. They have amazingly good templates. I use it all the time for Forecast. In fact, one of the nerdy things I do with Forecast, because they have a WYSIWYG and an HTML editor, I will go in and paste from our RSS feed the the name of the show and the description and everything into the forecast block and it automatically takes the formatting out of the feed burner link and puts it in there for me then i click the little html button boom i'm in to be able to edit the html and i can paste the code for the embed of the video it's so easy to use squarespace go try it out don't take my word for it you don't need a credit card as i mentioned you just need to go to squarespace.com try it out for free if you like it and you want to keep it you'll get 15 percent off for six months when you use the offer code TNT2, don't forget that offer code, TNT2, when you buy squarespace.com, offer code TNT2, 15% off for six months. And we thank them for their support of Tech News Today. Hopefully you will thank them for their support in some way as well.
All right, this uh, this probably should be a rumor mill, uh, but uh, China Times r- reporting. There we go. We might as well play. Quick draw hell. Trying. Uh, <laughs> China Times reports that Amazon decided to add Foxconn to the OEM list for the Kindle Fire, specifically for the Kindle Fire 2, to lower costs. Amazon's also going to take over selection and certification of components. Essentially, with Kindle Fire to get it out the door quick, they allowed Quanta to not only build it, but also select the components and put it all together, which is one of the reasons it probably looks so much like a BlackBerry playbook, because Quanta made the playbook as well. Now Amazon is taking over the selection and certification of components. Quanta will continue to assemble the original Kindle Fire, uh, but suppliers expect to start component deliveries to Foxconn for the Kindle Fire 2 in March. That would mean that we would see a new Kindle Fire probably shipping sometime May or June. Smart of them. Uh, I, I think the sooner the better, uh, especially if they can lower the price, which, you know, assuming that the Kindle Fire 2 is going to go up against an iPad 3, along with all other tablets, but the two are, are you know, the, the, the two most popular uh, tablets, at least right now. Um, if they can rush out something that's is beefed up spec-wise and cheaper, they were going to oh, I don't it. know about cheaper. I mean, think about this. It, it was... What was it priced at two fifty? Or I'm sorry, it was priced at two hundred. It cost them two fifty from Quanta, and it was that cheap because Quanta had already made it. It was called the Playbook, and really all they did was just change a couple of design things. And that's a very simple thing to do, especially when they already have the molds and everything else to do that. Uh, so if they're going to a different manufacturer and going from scratch this time, don't you think it would be more expensive? Well, China Times argues in the in the article, at least according to UnwiredReview.com, that. They are going to save money because they're able to go out and, and market the parts, whereas Quanta was buying all the parts before. So now Amazon can go out and strike deals the way mm-hmm. Apple goes out and strike deals and says, hey, you know what? We need like a good, a we need a a good deal man. on a processor. What can you, what can you do? I'm going to write down a number. You write down a number. And- Speaking of numbers, I mean, I mean, Amazon seems to have sold – the numbers are not official. But we've seen something like 3 million, 6 million. They've sold a lot of these fires, and the thing is their demand is pretty high. So they can say, look, we want a deal because – we're going to sell 10 million of these Kindle Fire 2s. We want the price of the processor down here. We want the screen this this size, this resolution. And the thing is, because their version of Android is getting more mature, I'd assume they'd be able to tweak it for even maybe even slower processors or even stick to the ones they have now. Because as time moves on, these processors get cheaper anyway. And their, their Android, uh, I guess, port or whatever, their version of Android isn't exactly power hungry by any means. So as time goes on, this stuff's going to get cheaper anyway. But picking the parts for themselves... That's probably going to help them, uh, help, help them not have losses every freaking Kindle Fire sale. Yeah, it's always cheaper when you BYO. Uh, I think it is smart, too, for Amazon to be coming out with something in the summer this time instead of so close to the holidays. Although, well, I guess we're going to see an iPad in March. I mean, I think we're pretty mm-hmm. certain about that. So so they'll, they will have had a chance for that fury. To ebb and flow yeah, a bit. Yeah, to kind of fade a little mm-hmm. before we, we see a summertime Kindle. So maybe a little early. I would say fall might be better, but we'll see. Uh, let's move on to Nevada approving self-driving cars. So no one in Nevada has to drive their cars anymore. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right, Tom. <laughs> the first state. Uh, no, yeah, there will be nowhere driving cars. You just press a button and it'll go. No, that's not not exactly how it's going. Um, on Thursday, Nevada approved rules for testing driverless cars on state roads. So that means they've basically they've for got testing. Okay. Yeah. So right. it's it's if you do this 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 and this, then we will allow you company X to begin testing driverless cars if you have quite a bit of money. Companies that want to start with this program will need a bond of between $1 million and $3 million, depending on how many cars you want to test just to be able to play. Cars also have to have two people inside. One person must be able to take control in the event of an emergency. That's going to be part of the testing process um, throughout Texting while driving will be allowed. Drinking while driving will not be. Never, never, never allowed. Never, even if you're not never driving. Never expect that right. to ever. Yeah, because can't because do you it. are the fail safe, right? If it well, stops working, pass- you have to be able to. Well, the to drive. Well, can't even be the driving either. Can't. Yeah, yeah, no, no one can be dry, uh, drinking uh, inside the car. Period. Cars will need to have sort of the equivalent of an airline black box, so anything that's happening in the car um, can be recorded for for research purposes. They'll also have red license plates, so if this ends up being approved for the public one day, those license plates will become green. Nevada um, uh, regulators say, you know, the the normal Nevada. 
Nevada license plates are grayish blue, so they should stand so out you, really nicely. So if you nicely. see one, somebody in a car like, turned around looking in the back seat, but yeah. they've got a green or a red license plate, then that's you, okay. Then you know, <laughs> you right. know what's going on. Right. Now, Google says, listen, we've got a really good track record. We have over 140,000 self-driving cars on the, uh, have racked up uh, over 140,000 miles, rather. Seven of our cars have driven 1,000 miles human-free, totally. There was one accident on record um, that was while the car was in manual mode. So yeah, according to Google, anyway, right, right. that was And Google's that was not the only one error. at this. Uh, yeah, they're that's... also shared by BMW, Volkswagen, and Audi all working on this. So, yeah, so if uh, legislation goes through in Florida and Hawaii, we could see even more innovation faster in this front. That's right, Darren. I like Very the true. fact that you can actually, uh, once once they're approved, now this isn't allowed during the testing phase, but if, the, if you get one approved, the operator doesn't have to be in the car all the time. No, but the operator who is responsible for the car, the person who holds that license, is responsible if that car hits and kills a pedestrian, say. So your yeah. car's kind of like your dog. So, so if, if so that thing kills... No, it's like kit. It's like, well, no, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> and it drives up to you and you get in, <laughs> right? No. It's maybe, and says, I hit someone and killed them. Let's run. <laughs> I'm run, sorry, Michael. Michael. I killed somebody. Less that's why Michael, Michael Knight doesn't exist. Dog. That's why. <laughs> but, yes, it's, it's, yeah, you, you have to be responsible while driving, the driverless car thing. Hey, it's being tested in Nevada. There are other states that are interested. I would guess that in Nevada, it's a great place to do it because besides metropolitan areas like Las Vegas or, I guess, Reno, it's pretty open road out there. You can do a lot of self-driving, and, and maybe as a whole, the citizens are more okay with that. Yeah, I was curious. Like, You would think they would push for this in California since it would be easy for Google to test mm -hmm. their vehicles in California, but you're right. There's there's more open space uh, in in Nevada. I guess there's a lot of open space in Hawaii, at least on the big island. Oh, do you remember the cab lines at CES? Maybe this would be a great thing. Yeah. You know, if these cars could just keep moving. Let's go, let's go. Ride, ride with cars, we can go from Oh, you know that the first time that these are, there, there's, this is going to happen at CES, once somebody's got something they feel safe enough to, yeah, to let other folks in. And that will be the big CES thing. Oh, that we don't year. even care about the tech other than like, oh, wow, we got to place from point no A kidding. to B. Remember when we talked about TVs? Forget These that. taxi lines are amazing. Quick, quickly around the table, <laughs> do you tr do we, we, will you trust yourself to a driverless car? Jay, uh, we'll start with you, Darren. Absolutely. As long as your hands are on the wheel, just kind of letting the wheel flow under it and you're paying attention to the road still, why not? So you think you'd, you'd want to like stay really closely involved. Well, it's the the problems come where you're going over like a crest where it's like kind of like a blind crest and the car's navigation systems don't know any more than you do about what's on the other side. So yeah, in situations do. like that, you would want to be able to like, you know, hit the brakes and disengage the auto. You don't think they know more than you do what's on the other side of that crest? They've got they've got satellite maps and and they can see well, they, they know where the road images. goes, but they don't know if there's a cow in the middle of it. You know, but won't they be scanning with infrared? But how they I'm talking about a blind curve. Through the yes. hill? I'm yes. talking about a cow. <laughs> <laughs> Watch I out for cows and your self-driving cars. That. Okay. You Jason, what me. about you? Uh, yeah, I would absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, Prius, like Prius, for example, is so computerized. Obviously, it's not driving for you, but there's already so much computer technology in our cars nowadays. You must have a newer one than me. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> there's, my, they're my, smart. They're very I, smart. I mess mine up in the parking garage. Oh, okay. I ask? I'm all for it. I'd, I'd get into one of these things. I don't see the problem in it. I was like, if, it, it's going to be a risk, I think, at first, but why not? I'm, I've been waiting for this for years. What about you, sir? Uh, just today, I passed somebody where I was like, why are they going so slow? They're almost in the fast lane. And it was some guy texting, so I beeped at him, you know, gave him a dirty look, and he looked at me like, screw you, lady. Yeah, right. I would rather he be in a driver, uh, driverless car. Yeah. So then he can text. <laughs> if it was a driverless car, so he wouldn't be in there. He would be sitting there okay. texting. Be a passenger oh, Tom, full. you know what I mean. Passenger full car. What I'm saying is it. the users are bad drivers. Let the cars take over. Wow, 100%. I, I, no, 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 no. Keep manual control of driving and then leave all the texting to your car. That's <laughs> what we need. And we've, we've all seen Total Recall. So, you know, if Johnny Cab taught us anything, right. it's that we should totally be okay with driverless cars. Just make sure it's clear, though, that it's not called cruise control. You know, people, there's, old, uh, there's urban legends. Somebody hits that button. They're like, oh, it'll drive itself. It mm, might one day. Right off a cliff. After Speed 2, no one's calling anything cruise control. 
That's a good point. <laughs> Let's finish off uh, Netflix now. Netflix brings back DVD-only subscriptions for seven ninety nine a month. I saw this story earlier today, and I was like, oh, well, that's, I guess it's interesting. I didn't realize that. I'd forgotten that they'd gotten rid of them. Whatever. Yeah. Everyone's aflame. Like, aha, see, Netflix is a flip-flopper. They're the John Kerry of tech companies. They can't keep a position. And... Uh, I don't know. Is it is this a, a big deal that they're bringing back the seven ninety nine a month? Go to dvd.netflix.com, DVD only subscription. It's a big deal for anybody who was super mad that the prices went up. They did that split. They were going to do yeah. Quickster and Netflix, and then the DVDs were only going to be on Quickster. Then they backtracked on that. But when they rejoined Netflix, I guess they they had a streaming plus DVD plan only, which cost mm-hmm. a little bit extra. So I guess if there are people out there who really want just the DVDs and no use for the streaming, they don't want to pay for the extra service, it's not a bad thing. I'm just kind of curious about how if Netflix keeps, I guess, not, I don't want to even say backtracking. They're listening to people. If their customers are saying, look, we want this, and they do it, like, are they gaining any goodwill by doing any of this? Or is it just constant, like, wow, Netflix, you don't know what you're doing. You're going backwards. It's like, well, they, people loved Netflix, you know, like a year ago. So maybe going backwards isn't a bad thing. I'm just mm-hmm. kind of like, are they building any reputation? Go backwards to where people liked you. Yeah. That's a smart idea. I think the you you're bowing to the will of your community is you know you can you can overlook that if it means the community is saving money. You know, I mean, who who who's really going to be looking down on Netflix for this? The only people who are really concerned are the people who say, "Awesome, here's the subscription I used to have." It's like nothing bad ever happens. I guess if you wanted this and they took it away and you couldn't get it, now you'd be like, "Oh, so now now you finally change it." Well, I've moved on. I've got Blockbuster. Well, now. that nobody's <laughs> holding the gun to their head. They can move who's right back that? if they feel like it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I just think it's great that they're switching over from the packet switching network to the parcel switching network. Well, they're you not know, switching over. They're just adding. They're adding a little. Mm-hmm little sneaker net. <laughs> and the sneakers are worn by the U.S. Postal Service. Let's move on to the news views. <laughs> I hadn't played that one in a while. Washington Post reports the New York Times is angry with Apple. A New York Times source tells the Post that, quote, they, referring to Apple, are playing access journalism. I've heard it from people inside Apple. They said, look, you guys are going to get less access based on the iEconomy series. The I Economy series refers to the Times piece about Foxconn factory conditions in China where iPads are assembled. Wall Street Journal was granted access to Mountain Lion in advance of its release and scored an interview with Apple CEO Tim Cook. Proving that people love a good patent story, Fandroid.com has dug up a Google patent filing via Reddit that covers the notification bar in Android. The Reddit post asks the question, why hasn't Google sued Apple about this, considering Notification Center is so similar? That patent was filed back in January 2009, but hasn't been granted yet. If it's approved, patent war, maybe? Yeah, maybe not. AFP reports that ProView might sue Apple in the United States for two billion U.S. dollars. ProView says it owns the trademark to iPad. We've heard this before. While Apple claims it bought the rights like years ago. Meanwhile, ProView also tried to uh, refresh everyone's memories by showing off its iPad, which it produced between 1998 and 2009. This device is an all-in-one PC, which bears a resemblance to the original iMac. Oh yeah, and the first iMac debuted in 1998 Over. when this thing did. So, good on you, ProView. Hmm. Mm. Good news to Foxconn workers. The company has increased pay by 16 to 25 percent for its workers in China. While some may look at this as a reaction to the impending Fair Labor Association investigations, Foxconn was quick to note that, quote, the basic salary of junior workers in all of Foxconn's China factories are already higher than the minimum wage set by the local governments. And I don't know if you saw the Fair Labor Association's uh, president uh, is quickly backtracking from his, everything seems great at Foxconn because he took a lot of heat. It's called Netflixing. Yeah, so so now he's like, we're calling it Quickster. No, he's 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 saying, oh, we we still got it. They still got a lot to improve on. I'm not I'm not giving them a pass yet. Uh, Twitter will allow 10,000 advertisers access to its ad platform. To qualify, the advertiser must be an American Express card holder or a merchant that accepts Amex cards. Amex also will credit advertisers $100 to each ad buyer. Twitter says 3,000 marketers are already in the program. Where will those ads be? 
Uh, it's what, unclear. Well, I think they're the ones that, that show up in the timeline. In, yeah, those are the new ones. In yeah. line. Yeah. I see. All subscribers to Orange, a mobile carrier in Africa, will have access to Facebook via their mobile phones, regardless if the device is a smartphone or a feature phone. Thanks to a partnership between Orange and Myriad, phones will receive Facebook data via unstructured supplementary service data, similar to SMS. The simplified version of Facebook will be text-only, and users can check or update their status. Flickr and Hunch co-founder Katarina Fake has announced a new startup called Pinwheel. The site is in private beta and seems broadly similar to Pinterest. Fake explains Pinwheel as a way to, quote, find and leave notes all around the world. The notes can be public or private, shared with an individual, a group, or everyone. They can be organized into sets. You can sign up to maybe get into the beta at pinwheel.com. It's a fake startup <laughs> called Pinwheel. Piper Jaffray analyst Gus Richard wrote today that Apple is working on a laptop with an internally designed chip based on ARM, <gasps> a project that might pose a serious risk to Intel. According to this research note, everybody got all excited, and then the statement went on to assert that the Apple Notebook project will not necessarily come to fruition in a commercial product. It's just that, well, they work on ARM stuff at Apple, so good guess. Nice. Guess what the uh, University of Minnesota's College of Science and Engineering have been working on? Well, they've devised a low-cost way to find out your location if you're using a GSM phone. You see, the attackers call the target's phone several times, but they hang up five se within about five seconds, which is before your phone rings. It's just long enough for the cell tower to send out a page that's typically with GSM uh, in plain text. And if they, the attacker, is in the same LAC or location area code, uh, not to be confused with your phone number's area code, as you, they can sniff it up and determine if you're in the area. So so could this be used, I mean, maybe illegally, but could this be used by the police or, or surveillance? Yeah, to, actually, to, this could be used by the to police. To find out where, to track me, to find out where I am. This could be used by the police without a search warrant, for example, to find out if, say, they know your house is in one LAC, and then they they uh, do this, and they're in they're in the area of your house, and they they do this method of calling you and hanging up, and uh, and then they you know notice they don't see the packets, then they know that ah you're not at home or you're not in the area of your house. I don't know. So one that, use. Yeah, I mean, is this is this easy to do? Is this a, well, what is, you need is you need a cheap hacked Nokia feature phone, you need a special cable, and you need some open source software. So yeah. <laughs> so it's not that it's not that hard. It sounds like no, no. What's fascinating about this is it. it well, uh, first of all, keep in mind that this only works against targets using GSM networks, and and of that, only on two two G networks. So so criminals well, use yeah. Verizon and Sprint. There you go. Um, AT&T and no uh, Nokia have actually been notified about this. And the way that the, the cool technical bit away about this, the way that it works, is that um, when they call you those five times, every time they call you, the tower sends out this thing called a TMSI. It's a temporary mobile subscriber number. It's different between different sessions. But they do it rapidly enough that they can correlate the TMSIs that they're seeing broadcasted everywhere by the towers saying, hey, is that phone around? And they're like, okay, that was us. Now we're sure it's us. And by the fifth time, they're like, we're absolutely positive that's us calling. So how worried should I be? And is there any, any steps that I should take if I want to make sure nobody can track me? You could turn off 2G networks, and then your phone wouldn't use those protocols. And not all Wait, implementations... Wait, you turn off Edge? Is that... Yeah, if you turn off Edge. Right. And, not, and keep in mind, not, not all implementations of Edge are going to use this plain text uh, method of sending out this TMSI. So, you know, your mileage may vary, uh, but yeah, turning off edge or switching to a CDMA carrier. All right. I'm joking about the last one. Switching to, well, that's not a joke. I mean, that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we bring a, uh, we actually, whenever we go to hacker conferences and we bring the hack shop, we bring, uh, we use Square to accept credit cards and we always bring like a CDMA phone to accept those because everyone at a hacker conference knows that GSM is out the window. Wow. Let's yeah. check the calendar. Anybody can install Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 and have access to all the multiplayer features for free from now until Monday on Steam. This is a really popular game. If you've always wanted to play it, it's the it's the title of the uh, biggest entertainment release of all time, having made over $1 billion in only 16 days. So now is your chance. Have fun. Pre-orders have begun for Spark. That's the open KDE tablet from uh, pre-orders, uh, at least from makeplaylive.com. Spark runs the Mer platform. 
uh, which isn't really about mermen, but it's a community-driven mobile Linux environment based on Amigo. And the project is uh, expected to ship to customers in May. Starting today, the Mojang team, if that name isn't familiar, they're the folks behind Minecraft. That's familiar are working for 60 hours straight to pump out a new game for the Humble Bundle Mojam event. And you can watch them do it. You can watch them uh, live webcast of the whole thing at HumbleBundle.com. Uh, look at them go. Yeah, fun. That's as programmers. As, as part of a Q&A on Nikon's uh, France France's Facebook page, the company has some D4 news. D4 launching on March 15th. D800 launch, launching a week later. D800E coming on April 12th. But that's France. That's France. The Verge said, well, what about the U.S.? Uh, a little bit more vague. Uh, Mid-March for the U.S. for the D4. D D800 late March. D800E mid-April. So roughly the same time frame. We yeah. just don't have anything concrete. And finally, uh, people love Angry Birds, right? Okay. Hey! <laughs> Tom Merritt, why I oughta. Agitated avian maker, that was Tom's joke, by the way, Rovio. <laughs> In case you didn't like it. Has announced that they will launch a new game called Angry Birds Space on March 22nd, but it's going to be different. According to Rovio's official website, this is a completely new game, innovative new gameplay, some of that familiar Angry Birds elements, but, but it's going to be different. So the game, this is the best part, is going to launch simultaneously in mobile gaming, animation, retail, and publishing. The novelization of Angry Birds. That's right. Graphic novel, I'm sure. And the cartoon. Don't forget the cartoon. And the plushie toys. Right, and the, and that's retail, right? There's a yeah. lack of there's a lack of gravity. It's not how you throw a bird. Ow! Yeah. My nose! How does my that nose. feel? Oh, my nose! <laughs> What's incoming? <laughs> incoming other than Angry Birds? We were not done. No. We, <laughs> yes, we, were, you totally, are. we were totally done. 260 uh, TNT Show is our phone number. We've got a couple of good voicemails today to play. Uh, first one about Gatekeeper in OS 10 Mountain Lion. Hello, TNT crew. I just wanted to comment on Mountain Lion having that uh, uh, being locked out to third party developers and let's check a box. Android does that, and I don't hear people complaining. And if you want to load third-party apps onto an iPhone, you jailbreak that. So, you know, I actually kind of welcome that where uh, it is just that little bit harder for possibly malware that's floating around on the Internet to tackle a machine, whereas with Windows or the current Mac software, uh, you know, those are going to be hit any time without, uh, without that signature. That's all I got. Have a good one. Now, that, you know, what, what everybody's getting upset about with this thing is that what Apple might do next, because really what they're doing right now, uh, Jason, if you've got my screen, uh, allow applications downloaded from Mac App Store, Mac App Store and identified developers or anywhere. It's right there in the security and privacy settings uh, in, in your system preferences. Very easy to make it anywhere and there, you know, and then be allowed to install whatever you want. So he's right. It's a really good point. It's it's not that much difference than any kind of other control on another system. It's just that everybody's freaked out like, oh, but what if they get rid of that anywhere option in the next version of it? I think what people are freaked out about is because this is a desktop operating system. This isn't like your phone. And people have taken, they've gotten used to the compromise with a phone operating system or a tablet operating system. They're like, eh, oh, yeah, there's some downsides to it. But you can't change what I know. You can't do that. And that's what people freak out about right well, away. Well, you know what I think is interesting is, you know, the revolution of the smartphone right now is really just kind of like the rebirth of the PC and like, mm -hmm. hey, hey, blank slate, let's use what we've learned and kind of come up with a new system. And you're seeing interesting concepts that are working on smartphones being backported over to desktops. Now, the fact that it's going it to default to Apple and, and identified signed content does mean it might make it harder for open source content to catch on as with the general populace the because they would have to go get Apple signed. And a lot of people may be like, oh, yeah, I'll try out this open source. Pro oh, I'm not allowed to install it. And because they're not a sophisticated user, they, they might not be able to, you know, they might not bother to go and change their settings. Kind of similar to like a motherboard with a bootloader that only runs signed code from Microsoft. Ah, kind of, is it? You know, is the it? saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's sad that that's the direction we're headed. Much ado about not getting anything yet. Yeah. I think, is that how the quote goes? 
Something yeah. works. That, yeah. That right. sounds Shakespeare. Right. Our next voicemail comes from Max. Uh, he has some thoughts about the Facebook verification method. Hey, TNT crew. This is Max from Wisconsin. Let me see if I understand this Facebook verification process correctly. Now, I can't contact them directly, and I have no badge to show that I have been successfully verified after it's done. So basically what happens is I get a call from some of them saying that they're from Facebook, and since I'm such a valued customer, they've decided to upgrade my account to a verified one. All I need to do is provide them with a document containing some rather sensitive personal information. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> if she someone emails you and says that they're a Nigerian prince yes. and that they would like your bank account information, you should also not give that to them. Uh, so Facebook went ahead and asked me if I would like to be verified this morning, even Aww, after I said, they'll never ask. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very proud moment. It's a big day. Yeah, so this is something that they asked almost in the way where Facebook will say, hey, do you want to switch over to the new UI? Well, they don't call it UI. You, you want to switch to a new timeline so type it's via of thing. Facebook.com? It's via Facebook.com, which is HTTPS. It was secure. There was no reason for me to believe that anything was weird about it. I mean, I, I'd be more concerned with, you know, do you want Facebook to have access to your driver's license? I mean, make sure that you gray out anything that you don't want any third party to have if for some reason any of this stuff becomes public. But Facebook isn't going to call you on the phone. Uh, I think you can rest assured. And if anybody does that, you hang up and don't give them anything. Yeah. So it's a, it's, it's a, good, it's a good thought from the caller, but yeah. it's good to know that Facebook is yeah. like, no, no, no. No, it was, it was very legit. But you know there's going to be a phishing scheme built on this out there. Oh, they sending emails. Love the phishing schemes. Yeah, exactly. It's so sad how easy they work. We have to watch out for those because we read your emails. And we also read the emails you send to us. Email from David. Hi, everyone. I love your show. I listen every day. What struck me as interesting in your recent story about the next version of OS X is that its expected release date is sometime in the summer. I was thinking this would likely coincide with the refresh of the MacBook and the MacBook Air line of computers. If this happens, then it is likely that Apple would leave the iPhone update to the fall so as to spread out its product launches. This would be in opposition to what many people think that the new iPhone would be launched in June. I was wondering, what are you guys? What are your thoughts about uh, this as a likely scenario? Keep up the good job. Ah, that that makes total sense. And I've been thinking that they're going to stick with iPhone in the fall anyway, despite all of these other rumors to the contrary. So that would make perfect sense to me if they do iPad in March, as we expect. We're ninety percent certain at this point, and then they do uh, a MacBook refresh shortly after WWDC. That makes sense to me as well. Because WWDC is all about development. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we see another iPhone refresh in the fall. And one of the weird things about MacBooks and MacBook Pros and Mac Pros, any of this stuff, like the, the cycle of that is so somewhat unknown compared to the iPhone. So if they could set up a schedule where you know, okay, well, I'm not going to buy it this, this cool period. I thought it's whenever Leo bought one. That's Isn't that not, the schedule? Unfor that's unfortunately not a schedule that's public. You know, it just seems to happen every now and then. But that's the thing. You have to check these sites and like, when do I buy it? So then it might, it might help out a bit. Yeah. On to the next email. Next email from Alan. Hey, guys, and Sarah. Thank you. I'm not a guy. Have you ever heard of an electric cooperative? If not, they're customer-owned electric companies. They're also telephone cooperatives hey, in areas of the guys. country. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of, too. Why don't people in rural areas from their own ISP cooperatives uh, make their own ISP Cooperatives. Other cooperatives were formed when rural areas were underserved with electricity or phone service, so why not the same thing for ISPs? The infrastructure for supply and internet service is cheaper than it's ever been, so now would be the time to do it. Also, cooperatives are not meant to make a profit, just provide the infrastructure and maintain it. Just saying. I think that's a fantastic idea, Alan. Yeah, I, haven't we talked about people that are already doing this? This they're, sounds they're, familiar to yeah, me. Yeah, we, we actually, uh, we've talked about a few groups who, who've tried this sort of thing, this sort of like, you know, I'm going to get my condo together and we're going to create our own ISP and yeah. roll it ourselves. Uh, so it definitely is happening out there. But I think it's something that could become a bigger deal, especially in those states where they've outlawed municipal governments from getting involved. Although it may in some way make it harder or illegal to create a cooperative because yeah. that could be yeah. seen as a quasi-governmental agency. And a lot of times these electric co-ops needed the cooperation of the government to get started. And maybe that would be considered illegal. I don't know. I hate how sticky these things get because the way that I feel is that we should have control over not only our internet connections, but even our cell phone connections. Like we should be able to roll our own of those as well. 
Yeah, I, 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 I think anybody should be able to do it. Government, community, otherwise. I, and I think the idea of Internet co-ops, especially for rural areas, is a fantastic yeah. idea. So Citizens I, I, of Egypt... Just yeah, that I, well, that's what I'm. I, when you start talking about Arab Spring, I start thinking of mesh networks, and I feel like yes. that's that's where communities could really get something going. Although that doesn't help rural areas a, a, as much yeah. because you, you need a networks. critical mass for that. Good stuff. All right, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Don't forget our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, is the place to go if you're like, you know, I wish you would cover this story. You submit it there, or you just go and see if somebody has already submitted it, and you vote it up or down. We look at those votes when we determine our lineup. We don't, we don't copy it over, but we use that as one of the sources to say, hey, is that getting a lot of interest? Yeah, maybe we should talk about that. So go there, technewstoday.reddit.com. Also, don't forget, uh, as you're watching the show throughout the year, if you see a moment that you particularly loved or thought was hilarious and you would like us to include it in our best of show at the end of the year, send it to us. TNT at twit.tv. Put the subject best of in the subject line and we will nestle it away. We'll squirrel it away in a little folder and that will make our job that much easier at the end of the year when Jason puts together our best of. And when I say our, I mean his because... That's that. That is, yes, that please, is a job. Thank you. If you so love please. Jason, please send those emails. <laughs> if you have any feelings, you have even compassion. if you hate Jason, send us a best of. <laughs> the more you send, the more work all. I'm going to have to do putting it all together. So <laughs> please, <laughs> either way, it's for Jason. <laughs> Jason's guaranteed to lose. Please help. Yes. <laughs> Darren Kitchen, always good to have you on Fridays. It's like Fridays were made for you. Oh, thank you. Love to be here. <laughs> What's going well, on at Hack 5 this week? Today, but, uh, we have more from ShmooCon 2012 and some fantastic stuff about breaking out of uh, application whitelisting, kind of sandbox dealies. And go and check it out. And even some Thermite meets hard drive action. Ooh, Thermite. thermite. I like that. Check that out. HAK5.org. That's it for us. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. And you can give us a call. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Monday is the day we celebrate people like James K. Polk and all of our other U.S. presidents. So we won't have a show, but we'll be back with you on Tuesday with special guest Mark Millian. See you then.